great. Welcome students, welcome teachers, and even welcome lovers and haters of composition. Christian Kuhn coming at you for another writing workshop, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of Composition. And up my sleeve in this writing workshop, I'm going to teach you how to sustain a super locked in cogent line of reasoning when you are tackling a poetry essay. And in this video, I'm going to give a nice cursory introduction to my heuristic that I use to construct my body paragraphs across the expository modes known as the syllogistic method. And when I do introductory lessons, I usually go very basic and, and kind of go back to elementary school sort of stuff and build from there. So with these advanced concepts, I like to use children's literature. So what I'm going to do throughout this workshop is draw a correlation between the classic children's bedtime story, Are You My Mother by P.D. Eastman, and my heuristic of the syllogistic method, which we use to cobble together our body paragraphs. And what you'll see is that P.D. Eastman's story is actually employing the syllogistic construct, and a lot of children's stories are written syllogistically. So this really resonates with students and helps things click, and I can see the proverbial light bulb illumine over their heads when I approach it this way. So with that said, before we dive in, please subscribe to the channel, sprinkle some love and hit that like button. Tell your friends and colleagues far and wide about this channel. So it's called Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross of Composition. And uh, this is kind of my home base for YouTube going forward. So I switched everything over to here and kind of defected from my old channel. So what I do in terms of the actual instruction of this is I have story time with my students. It's kind of silly. It's kind of goofy. But when I start throwing out things like the syllogistic method and Aristotelian logic, some students intellectually shut down immediately. And they're like, oh, man, Kuhn's getting all difficult and he's pontificating about all this philosophical linguistic stuff. I'm tuning out. Right. So to really invite everybody in. We get on the on, on the floor, sit in a circle, and I read them, Are You My Mother? And I break down how Eastman is going premise, premise, conclusion in that story. Every page is a syllogism, right? You turn the page, you go first premise, second premise, conclusion. And I'll unpack what I mean by that in just a second. We'll actually look at Aristotelian syllogisms in just a second. But I, um, I just read it to them, and then I found something really cool. If you want to have a really cool story time with your students, check out a preview of this video that I found on YouTube. I'll be quiet now and just take a quick little glimpse of it, and then I'll pick up in just a second. Up went the baby bird. But now, where was the snort going? Uh-oh, oh, what is this snort going to do with me? Get me out of here. So to really keep things enticing and uh, fun, that video is pretty neat as, to accompany the story as well. So let me explain what the syllogistic method is, its history, its origins, and then we'll actually get into piecing together a, a poetry analysis in just a second here. So it comes from the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum. And the town's boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling, kind of like closely akin to lawyer school these days. And they would often throw out these juicy essential questions. And you may stumble upon this when you get into like an introductory introduction to philosophy course. It's called Plato's Republic, seminal text. And all they do is banter around the following essential question. What is justice? And all these philosophical think tankers and students step to the proverbial mic and they grapple with that question. And Aristotle said, hmm. Why are some kids really good at arguing? Some are men. Some just can't really string an argument together all that well. And us composition teachers ask the same questions. Some of you are better at this task than others. No surprise, right? And Aristotle had a eureka moment in studying like the internal machinations of the better students thinking uh, cogs. And he said, I got it. They're going syllogistically. And all he meant by that was, 
they were proceeding very mathematically, kind of like in a computative formulaic way. And he said, they go from premise, premise, conclusion. So if I were to give you the following example, see if this makes sense. See if it's cogent, rational, logical. So I say in my first premise, arsenic is deadly. You would nod your head and say, yes, Christian, you are absolutely 100% correct. But if I follow it up with a second premise that states this, my dog ate arsenic, you are naturally going to conclude because it's logical that my dog is going to die, right? That's not going to be a good situation for my dog. It's not going to bode well. You know, that's not going to work. And when you guys think on paper, this is how it kind of needs to be packaged and housed. Very lockstep. And again, in composition, we typically refer to that as line of reasoning. Throughout my presentation, I will interchange uh, cogency with line of reasoning, right? It's just bulletproof logic. So how do we take Aristotle's heuristic and morph it into a heuristic to perform literary analysis? Here it is. So premise one for literary analysis is going to be an argument containing terms, devices, techniques. You got to keep in mind that literary analysis is an expository mode and all expository writing is an act of argumentation. And I'm pretty hardcore on this with my students. There's a huge, vast difference between plot analysis and literary analysis. And I want my students to perform literary analysis from top to bottom. As such, I have some rules for this. That first premise is going to take three sentences, and I'm going to model this for you in just a second. It takes three sentences, and the reason being is this. On FRQ1 for the AP language exam, the college board frequently states, your argument must be central. And to keep the argument central and to really ensure that we do not get waylaid or distracted by plot summation, we're going to argue with our terms, devices, and techniques for three sentences. Beginning in the fourth sentence, we're going to introduce our textual support. And this is going to come in the form of a teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. And then in the end, we have our conclusion, which is textual analysis. And this is our link, our echo, and our promise. So in a second, I'll show you how P.D. Eastman's Are You My Mother falls into this and helps demystify this and unpack this for it in simpler terms. But just to keep things light and uh, engaging, I'm going to show you how to do this using Taylor Swift's song Karma. We're going to treat the, 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 the song Karma as if it's a poem. All right. So you might be asking yourself, what's a first premise look like? If we're going to unpack karma and analyze it like a poem, this is what we got. Students often ask, how do I begin my body paragraphs? And for the first body paragraph, my students typically use a stem that gets them anchored into the fact that they're going to have a chronological order, a progression. They're going to be very like calculative throughout their, their approach to their analysis. So it's four words and a comma right from the onset. Do you see that cues the reader into knowing that you're going to be organized? So we know that we're going to argue using our terms, our devices, our techniques, and we're going to take three sentences. So just look at what I got going on here. Right from the onset, Swift employs a few biblical terms in order to contrast herself to the subject of her prose. Further, through these correlations, she emphasizes her exigence. This anonymous person who harmed her intentionally will one day reap the errors of their way. Syntactically, her looping refrains and rhetorical questions further bolster her proclamation about the laws of karma. All right, here's the deal. We're going to start drawing our comparison or our correlation to Are You My Mother? A mother has a responsibility to its child, right? To keep the promise of I'm going to be your mother forever and ever and ever. And in a first premise, you also have a promise. And you might be asking yourself, what's being promised here, right? If in order to write the rest of this syllogism, we have to stick with what's promised. So let's take a look at that first premise again. In order for this to stay cogent, in order for us to have a line of reasoning, we have to have quotes and or paraphrases 
for everything that I highlighted in green. So we have the allusions in the biblical language, the contrast between characters. We have her theme or the exigence, and then we're going to have a focus on the syntax as well. So all of those things, right, we have to go find quotes and paraphrases for. And in terms of the story, Are You My Mother, the bird falls out of the nest. And at this stage of the composition, the bird falls out of the nest. And then we have to get back to our mother. We have to get syntax quotes. We need biblical allusion quotes and or paraphrases. Everything we promise has to get back to the nest by the conclusion of the syllogism. So let's keep the first and second premise connected. I'm going to have an exercise with you guys and see how well you can uh, select quotes. So second premise, I'm going to begin it like this. Immediately, the narrator mentions that her foil is. And students, get into the lyrics of the song and see what works best there. What could I quote in that line? So immediately, the narrator mentions that her foil is. All right, go think about that for a second. Maybe you want to, if teachers, if you're doing this exercise, have your students throw some quotes up on the board. That's what I do with my students. And after that, I show them how I fill in the blanks there. Look at, look at how my second premise continues. Immediately, the narrator mentions that her foil is talking shit for the hell of it and that this person is addicted to betrayal. Do you see, we're returning the mother, the, the, the bird back to the nest with the mother. Those quotes are perfect, right? In order for line of reasoning to work and to stay intact and stay cogent, students, you must quote with deliberation. You must paraphrase with deliberation, right? So if we go back to the first premise, I promised you that I would do that, right? It's a promise. So those quotes fit perfectly within that line. In fact, they're probably the only two that I could do. So one thing I want to talk about here is this. Oftentimes when students quote, they only quote once at sentence level. Do you see how I quoted twice there? That's complex, right? Students, try to do that from time to time in your paper. I think it bodes well, especially when you're in contention for the sophistication point. It's one more wrinkle of nuance that you can do to really help you along. But we're not done. There are more promises we have to keep. We're clearly not done with our body paragraph. So what do we do next? So let's take a look at how we build upon this. Immediately, the narrator mentions that her foil is talking shit for the hell of it and that this person is addicted to betrayal. To accentuate the subject's downward karmic progression, Swift suggests that he's terrified to look down in order to observe everyone he burned just to get there. Clearly an allusion to hell, the lines of the dichotomy are perfectly delineated. Those who do bad shall receive an equal, if not more, life-serving dish of bad. All right, so why did I do all of those things there? Why did I choose these quotes? Do you remember in the first premise that I mentioned allusion? I need the allusion quote, right? So the mention of hell is the only thing that I could really quote there. So this obviously returns the bird back to the nest, right? You want to avoid the snorts, right? Just follow like the, the, the story, are you my mother? It's like the bird going up to the dog and saying, are you my mother, right? When the bird does that, it's kind of akin to us doing this, choosing the wrong quotes and the wrong paraphrases, breaking the line of reasoning, not staying cogent. So from here, we're still not done. We got to go on intentionally characterizing herself in an opposite life, Swift is apt to express that her, and I want you guys to go find the quotes here. Are you my mother? And that she, are you my mother? Go find two quotes that fit there. I'm in the characterization portion of my syllogism, right? Because I promised you in the first premise that I would do characterization. So teachers, if you're working with your students, maybe pause here and have them get into the song lyrics and choose the best quotes. Here is how I fill the, uh, the blanks there. Intentionally characterizing herself in an opposite light, Swift is apt to express that her comma is a god 
and that she keeps her side of the street clean. So as you can see there again, absolute deliberation with the quote selection. Those are the perfect quotes to hammer home my promise with regards to characterization, right? And I'm just, you know, modeling how to do some things. Two quotes in one sentence is a really cool thing to do from time to time. You don't need to do it every single instance that you embed the quote, but it's pretty cool if you can pull that else uh, out. So what else did we promise? We're still not done. Check this out. There's still more. The pronouns further advance this character schism in that the you is harshly rebuked while the I is cast with a certain degree of impeccability. All right, I'm talking about pronouns. So pretty much the only thing I can quote is the you and the I, right? So it's kind of kind of hard to, to quote pronouns. You, know, you, you, only, you only got two of them in the song. So it's just easy, right? Those fit. Even the natural imagery highlights this difference. While her ex is a spider boy weaving his little web of opacity, Swift's karma is a cat purring in her lap. The rhetorical questions advance this sentiment along with the chastising tone. Repeatedly, almost like a taunt, Swift asks, aren't you envious that for you it's not? Right. So therefore, we got all of our promises. Right. We kept them all. We have quotes and paraphrases for everything that we promise. But we still got to conclude. Right. We have to return everything to the nest and go full circle. Right. Let's bring that bird back to its mom. So in the conclusion, you go back to the thesis and you really come full circle on the first premise. So check this out. Just as the chorus, verse, and refrain circle back repeatedly, Swift has one promise for this nameless you. Karma will one day hunt him down. It's nature's decree. It's also divine law. So usually in the conclusions of my syllogisms, I just take like two sentences typically to, uh, to, to bring it full circle. Usually one, two, three sentences is all it takes. And that, my friends, is a cogent line of reasoning. That's how you stay really focused. And that's how you pull the strings of my syllogistic method heuristic. So students often ask, you know, how many sentences should I shoot for in a syllogistic body paragraph? Because Christian, that was kind of long. And my body paragraphs typically are 10 to 12 sentences. I kind of keep it around there. I really am a firm believer that those little itty bitty four or five sentence baggers that students are so accustomed to writing, you're not going to be able to get enough support and analysis in there to really fully flesh out an argument. So I, I, I need more space and I find that my students need more space to really have a good full body argument. So I got a question for you guys. You ready for this? Want to give it a whirl. I have a first premise for you. All right, let's build it together. Let's have you build the syllogism. So brick by brick, I wrote the first premise for you. All right, and I'll read it in just a second. On your own, I want you to finish the syllogism. So go quote, quoting, quote hunting and paraphrase hunting with deliberation, right? I got the first three sentences done for you. You're gonna take off with the second premise. So here is my first premise. As the song progresses, Swift moves away from biblical diction and takes up the argument with legal jargon. But to further the concept that this is quite simply nature's divine course, she also cushions her thesis with more natural imagery. Syntactically, to really solidify her point, she continues to employ repetition and parallelism. All right, we have to figure out what the promise of the first premise is in this. So the first thing we promise is that she takes up the argument with legal jargon. So we're going to need quotes and or paraphrases for the legal jargon. And then this also is talking about the naturalistic imagery. So we're going to need quotes and paraphrases for that. And then we're going to incorporate some more syntax analysis in here and uh, take a look at the repetition and parallelism. So we got three things going on here. And I think students and teachers, if you're if you're seeing this, what you, you'll, you can see what I'm doing here in the first premise. The first premise really allows students to multitask so that they're not going about their essay in the following manner. 
one paragraph tone, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph diction, one paragraph extended metaphor. That's too plotting, too dutiful, too elementary, and it's not going to bode well uh, at any level. I, I, I don't even want my on-level ninth graders doing that. It's too, too basic, right? So they can multitask in this first premise. If they use the three sentences to argue, again, get the summation, get the plot out of those first three sentences. So that's the promise of this first premise. Here's what I need you guys to do. Return every bird to the nest, right? You're going to need to go get a quote and or a paraphrase for everything that I promised in that first premise. So flesh that all out, 10 to 12 sentences, and make sure you throw a conclusion on there. Get that bird all the way back to its mom in the nest. All right, I'm signing off, kids. I'm signing off, teachers. Happy teaching, happy writing. I hope you can figure that out, and I hope that I elucidated some things for you as far as the syllogistic method goes. If you want to drop me an email, feel free, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I know some people are bashful, and they're like, can I really email this guy a question? Absolutely. So I love getting emails and responding to teachers and students. I love it, love it, love it. So don't, uh, don't hesitate. Also note that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. I present quite a bit too in the circuit with NCTE, Perfection Learning. And it looks like I might even be doing an AP conference this summer. So uh, I have a website, teachinghowtowrite.com. It has a calendar of all my PD offerings, uh, you know, where I'm at on the road and uh, even what I'm doing in my classroom at present moment. So check that out and there's some free resources there. Students, I do have my own tutoring company. It's called Write at Ivy Write. So I did my graduate work at Ivy League institutions and I'm really well versed on the college personal statement. I got some good tricks up my sleeve to help kids write killer personal statements. So as you apply for college and want to work with me on that, drop me an email. And I also do a lot of AP Lang and AP Lit tutoring as well as, as well as just general composition. Been doing this for well over two decades. So pretty expert at it at this stage of the game. That's it from here. Be well, and I'll follow this up with other videos covering the expository modes, also using Are You My Mother? Take care.